Today's speaker, I'm really excited to introduce you to uh, and welcome her back to Atlanta and back to GSU. She, uh, she and I had come into connection with each other uh, because I was at a language advocacy event and I met somebody from Marriott and she introduced me to somebody else who then put me in touch with, with Seema and we were able to work with the School of Hospitality to bring her in October to meet with students and I said, well, the, we also have this other event that is in May that you really have to come to and, and she said, absolutely. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you and welcome back Seema Jane. It, um, okay, perfect. Thank you, Bill. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, bonjour, guten tag, hola, konnichiwa, ni hao, namaste, ciao, howdy, hi, what's up? Anything else I could have missed, Maraban? Yo, yo is good? That's good? Aloha. Thank you for my friends from Hawaii. All right. Well, thank you, Bill, for introducing me, and I appreciate everyone today. Hope you're enjoying your lunch, and uh, feel free. I do run a very interactive, casual session, and I hope you enjoy the video presentations, the dialogue that we have in the next uh, one hour or so. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Seema Jane, and I am the Director of Multicultural Affairs for Marriott. And you're probably thinking, what is a Director of Multicultural Affairs? Well, let me tell you, my husband thought the same thing. And I said, no, 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 it's not what you're thinking. I said, I have the honor to work with 6,000 hotels around the world, 120 countries, and now a total of 30 brands. For those of you who don't know, Marriott International acquired Starwood about a year and a half ago, so we have 30 brands that we're very proud of. So my job is very easy. It's actually one of the best jobs in the world. And you know it's the best when your children like explaining it to their friends. <laughs> and they know how to explain it. And it's not like, well, dad's in IT. But let me tell you what my mom does. <laughs> so my job is very simple. I get to go to the hotels and markets all around the country, around the world, and give them tools and resources to be culturally competent when we have guests from other backgrounds. They might want to learn about how to host an Indian wedding, or a Jewish bar mitzvah, or we have a Chinese guest who's coming here for leisure travel, Middle Eastern guests, guests from around the world. We have different segments that we work with very closely. We have Hispanic community, our veterans, our people with disabilities, LGBT. So that's my job, is to make sure they have the tools to be culturally competent so they can be confident when they are working with the guests coming to our hotels. Pretty simple, right? So most of my time is spent on the road working with different markets. I do reside in Chicago, and my headquarters is in D.C. So for those of you who didn't know, Marriott is headquartered in D.C. A couple of things. I will share a little bit about my background throughout the entire presentation, but I am a first-generation Indian. My parents came here in 1960s. How many of you have parents who are in that similar boat? They came here. Okay, a few of you. So coming here to this country, my parents came in the 60s. Um, my father came to be a professor. So I am very passionate about education. My father came here, and he didn't really know a lot of English. He read, was reading and writing, but speaking was not his cup of tea. But he came here, and he studied here in Atlanta, and that's where he got his master's. And then he moved to Columbia for his PhD in New York. My father came as a professor, and when I was growing up, I was actually born and found out that I have other uh, colleagues in this room who come from my university. I went to Miami University and I'm picking out my major. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one person. Miami University is in Ohio, for those of you who don't know. And my father was a professor of finance, statistics, and accounting, so the business school. Now, in our time growing up as a first generation, we didn't have any choices on degrees. Here's your four choices, Seema. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a business, or a professor. That's what he said. I said, okay, great, that's awesome, let's, let's, you know. But when you go to business school, which is what I ended up picking, I had two choices. 
He goes, of course you have choices, finance or accounting. <laughs> so this is the choices I got. So I took a finance undergrad, and I am very thankful that he pushed me in that direction. That's why this topic is so dear to my heart. How cultural competency can actually affect the bottom line of your business, your nonprofit, or whatever that um, organization you're with. So we'll get into a case study later on. I continued with the marketing degree and took some time off to raise kids. I did have a typical semi-arranged Indian marriage um, that our parents had set us up with. And after 28 years, I'm still very happily married to my fourth child, I would say. Um, I do have three children, <laughs> sorry. Um, but sometimes he's a little harder than the kids. Um, and maybe, maybe some women understand that feeling. But I do have three children. One is out of college, one in college, and one a junior in high school. So very familiar with the programs that you have. And I appreciate the people I've met in international relations and, and uh, different fields that my children are studying as well. So that's a little bit about me. I'd love to just get a quick poll from you. How many of you have traveled outside of North America? Great. Terrific. How many have gone to Europe? Quite a few. Asia. Oh my god, we have a great, great group of people here. How about Africa? Okay, Australia. A few. South America. I'm going to have Antarctica. No, okay. Let's just take another poll. How many people here are bilingual? How many people speak three languages? Four. Oh, we got a few. Five. Oh, well, we got, we got one, maybe five here. Four and a half. <laughs> Terrific. This is my honor today to be with such a great group. I was looking at the organizations, and I just want to sit with each of you and have a conversation. So I thank you for inviting me, Bill, and um, we'll start off with a quick video that I think you might enjoy. It's from um, National Geographic, and it's the world's most typical person. <laughs>
How'd you like that video? Wow, right? It certainly brings a new view to what the changing needs, wants, and attributes are in our global market. Think about who you work with today. Think about your team members. Think about your neighbors. Think about the student body. Things are changing in our world. From 30 years ago, when I grew up, to now, there's so much more diversity. When we think about diversity and inclusion, it is usually about women or minorities. That's what we used to think. But today we're expanding that discussion to encompass the broad ranges of differences that we see globally. Okay, let's go on. Let's take a quick trivia question. What's the fastest growing minority group in the US? So, kind of right there too. It is Hispanic community. They spend $70 billion domestically on U.S. travel market. That's important to somebody in my industry who needs to know who are coming to spend money. Right? So when we look at statistics of things that are changing, these are important things to note. However, I think you're right, Asian has surpassed a little bit. So newest statistics will come out with the 2020 census and we'll see what's going on there. Look at the changing demographics of America. So these are important to someone like me in my industry, but think how they could be relevant to you in your organization as well. You can see right here, Hispanic community, 70 billion in spend. But look at even LGBT, smaller population, but look at their spend. This is all important, and think about how it can be in your organization. You're also having very diverse mix of workforce, customers, suppliers, everything, students, so thinking about that. All right, so I'm gonna take you through a few series of slides, just three of them or so, but what is important to note is that when you are working with people of different backgrounds, communicating across cultures varies from the Eastern world to the Western world. Have you seen that before? Right, since you're all well-traveled, you've noticed that as well. So these slides were created by a Chinese artist that went to visit Germany. And he just put some basic, simple pictures together, right? So this is just a generalization. We can't say everybody from a certain country is a certain way. The Western slide, the blue side, is there to talk about how punctuality is very important in certain cultures, right? My good friend is German, and he tells me five minutes early is on time. Well, I'm Indian, and I'm the red side, and 10 minutes late is on time. So our thought process of on time is different. How many of you can relate to the blue slide? How many of you relate more to the red slide? Yeah, some of us do, right? So I tell them, bring a book. If you know I'm going to be a little late, just bring a book and read. <laughs> right? But I was telling someone that also we one day flipped, and he goes, okay, I'm going to be there um, late because I know she's going to be late. And I thought, I'm going to surprise him and get there early. <laughs> So we've, we've done things like that before. But when we look at communicating across cultures, these are things to note that people have. We call it IST, Indian Standard Time. We don't run anything on time. It's like your outlook says 8, but you know it's going to start at 8.15. Things are different. Think about when you've gone to another country. Okay? Certain cultures, they're a little more Latino cultures. Uh, here's my friend from Italy, who or, or, or had been from Italy. Yes, back there. We talked about this. Different cultures are lax. Some are very much on time, right? So an Indian standard time means when I send an invite to my friends, if they're Indian, I will say 7 p.m. for the party. And if they're non-Indian, I'll say 7.30. And then everybody kind of shows up on time. So I kind of adjust and learned that different cultures will have differences. Some of my Mexican friends say Mexican minutes, right? Going on a different schedule. So understanding that. Why is this important? My colleague came back from Spain, and she was a meeting planner, doing a meeting there. And she came to me and she said, Seema, I cannot believe there are kids running around at 10 p.m. at night. I said, what's wrong? She goes, they should be in bed. Well, I said, according to whom? I said, in their culture, things are a little bit later. Who says that 8 o'clock is a bedtime? That might be our culture. But don't think, they might think when they come here that why do you put your kids to bed before the sun goes down, right? Did we ever think that we might be a little different? When we talk about communicating across cultures, this is just one side of punctuality, but think of eye contact. 
the gestures that are different around the world. Body language, proximity when speaking to somebody. Certain cultures like to be closer. Certain want distance or no touching. So communicating across cultures is important. And why is that important? Because all of you are going to have business interactions every day. And to be successful and be operating your team successfully, you need to understand everybody at the table. Somebody may not be as vocal because in their culture, the senior executive might speak. Understanding all of this is important. And the best team out there is the one that's the most diverse. Everybody brings something to the table from a different lens that we're doing. So think about how you grew up. When you grew up, did you grow up on a farm? Did you grow up in a city? What was your environment that caused you to have the perceptions and assumptions and the reasoning that you have today? Everybody grew up differently. I grew up in a small town in Middletown, Ohio. Small town, if anybody read Hillbilly Elegy? Yeah, well that was my town. That's my high school, that's my calculus teacher in there, and that's my subdivision. All referenced, and my father worked for Armco. In that book, it's very interesting to reflect on my life, but my high school was 50% African American and 50% Caucasian, 2,000 students, and I was the one token Asian in that day. That was 30 years ago. I grew up liking hip hop and rap because that's the influence I had as a child. What you had as a child is going to be kind of the programming of your mindset. That's the beliefs and everything that you've had. So think about what you had that is who you are today. So that's a little bit just about on punctuality. Let's look at another one, way of life. Our Western world, we're a much more individualistic society. The Eastern world is a lot more collectivistic or group centric. Maybe you've seen that when working with people of different backgrounds. We're a little bit more me-centric, right? We sweat alone, we achieve alone, we think alone. It's about our small family of four or five. But at Eastern culture, it's about the group. The harmony is the paramount of the Eastern cultures. What's best for the group? Not always what's best for what I want. In that case, things might take longer when you're making decisions. So in my hotel world, I tell my teams, mm, you know what, I know your deadline's March 31st to get your contract signed, but you know, they're going to have four more site tours because everybody has to come. Grandma's got to come, uncle's got to come, the whole people have to come to see the site for the wedding. So be patient, be patient. So understanding this is going to help you when you're working with people of different backgrounds. And then the last one I wanted to share with you is contacts and relationships. Certain cultures are definitely more relationship building, others are task. My USA, Northern Europe, is definitely let's get to the task at hand. Other cultures, you have to build a relationship to build the trust. It's going to take a little time. You don't just start off saying, hey, let's get to the business. How's your family? How's your parents' health? We need to build that relationship a little bit more. So when you think about this, and you think about the context and relationships, in the Western, it's linear. You can go to someone, it's pretty direct, it doesn't have to be a lot of different people, but in the Eastern world, it's definitely different. It's a little bit more nonlinear, which sometimes makes it a little harder if you're on one side trying to work with somebody of a different side. But today's goal is not to get you to think, um, to change the way you are, but just to be mindful of someone else's views and how they think. So. Global mindset is a way of thinking. I really like this quote. Cross-cultural competence is the ability to view a situation from your perspective, the perspective of others, and seize the opportunity to solve problems, navigate situations, and develop more creative solutions. So we want to get into that global mindset. It seems like this room, you have a great audience that already has. So in my job, one thing I want to do is make sure I can teach um, my team members how to be culturally competent. In today's world with millennials, we love videos, right? Everybody's on YouTube, they love videos. So the next video was created by my team of two, my boss and myself, but I think you'll enjoy the little faux pas. So we called it the, super cult, the superhero videos and uh, we kind of show a scenario and then we rewind it to show the correct way of doing it. Again, be uh, mindful, this is all in a hotel city. Uh, hotel settings. All right, so this is our multicultural audience. I think everyone here is over 21 except my little baby who might be stepped out for a little, so we'll, we'll excuse her. 
We'll excuse her. We're so glad to have you staying with us while you're here on business, Mr. Tanaka. Please be sure to let me know if there's anything I can do to make your stay more comfortable. Thank you. I will do that. Please let me give you my business card. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. <laughs> Stop the interaction. You've just committed a cultural faux pas. This isn't the way to wow a Japanese guest. As a matter of fact, you've just offended him. Here are some important lessons from one of our multicultural experts. In Japan, business cards are extremely important for establishing credentials. Cards are presented after the bow or handshake. If your card contains Japanese, present it with the Japanese side facing your colleague in such a manner that it can be read immediately. Take a thoughtful moment to read the card presented to you. Handle cards very carefully. Do not put them in your pocket or in your wallet and never write on a person's business card. Let's rewind the scene and try it again. We're so glad to have you staying with us while you're here on business, Mr. Taneka. Please be sure to let me know if there's anything I could do to make your stay more comfortable. Thank you. I will do that. Please let me give you my business card. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. <laughs> good afternoon, Ms. Schmidt. How are you today? Five minutes late, not good. Please write where you right, are. Yeah. You've committed a cultural faux pas. If you're trying to book business with a German decision maker, you have to be especially sensitive to your appointment time. Let's hear from another expert and find out what our salesperson did wrong. Nowhere in the world is punctuality more important than in Germany. Be on time or even early for every appointment. Whether for business or social engagements, arriving just four or five minutes late can be an insult to a German executive. Reset your watches and let's try it again. Five minutes early. Ms. Schmidt, welcome. So nice to finally meet you. This is delicious. Enjoy your meal, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for dinner at the Bistro. I always love trying new places when I'm in the US on business. How was your soup? It was delicious. Whoa! <laughs> Don't make another move. You've just committed a cultural faux pas. Gestures are different in every country. Don't assume that what is customary in the U.S. is appropriate around the world. Let's find out what we just conveyed to our guest from Brazil. In most countries, the gesture the GM just made is recognized as an American gesture for everything is okay. However, in a host of other countries, Brazil being the best known, this gesture is considered very rude and obscene. Let's take a more global view and try this again. Enjoy your food, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining me for dinner at the Bistro. I always love trying new places when I'm in the U.S. on business. How was your soup? My soup was delicious, and it's my pleasure to dine with you. Multicultural Superheroes opens today at a trade show near you. Visit the Multicultural Booth increase your cultural confidence. So did you enjoy that? Learn something yes. that you may not have known? Great. So these are our educational, informational kind of videos that were shown at a general manager's conference. It came off to be a big hit because they're four minutes, easy to take in, and something to learn very quickly. So we had fun putting it. You'll see a sequel coming up with three other cultures later on in the presentation. Let at some of the things and why we are interested in learning about different cultures. For us, the visitation. Who's coming to this country is important. But for other people, think about this. I noticed in the last 10 years that my nieces and nephews are coming here for education more and more. You're seeing student body mix changing. You're getting people from all over the world coming. It makes it a little tough for our students in USA as they're fighting for spots. Everybody is now globally fighting for spots when they need to be placed somewhere. So we're seeing the student body change. We're seeing that H-1 visas are increasing also. So people are having job opportunities here. Um, I know our Marriott team, there's a lot of people that are from um, India, the IT side that is there as well. So we're seeing a change in our workforce every day. 
Think about what's happened. Smart visas, easier to get visas for people to travel. Think about middle income in China and Mexico. As that's rising, people have the first time opportunity to travel. So the world has changed than what it was 20 years ago, and we have to be ahead and recognize those changes and stay with that. Okay. Here's a program we put together. And maybe you have similar programs designing and targeting a different market. The Li Yu program is a program that was put together in Asia, <laughs> and it was designed to mandate that all Chinese travelers, when they're traveling within Asia, how do we cater to them in a consistent fashion? So we always make sure they had teas in the room, Chinese teas. We like to assign them with room number eight. Why do we like eight? It's a good luck number, yes, you know. It sounds like wealth when spoken in Chinese. So these are the little things we want to do. Chinese cuisine, we have Mandarin speaking staff. Again, when you talk about languages, how important it is, especially in my industry and probably in something you do, to have bilingual, have associates, customer, having your uh, team members being bilingual helps a lot. Um, and then we customize our newspapers and everything to them. So some of my hotels in USA actually have converted everything into Chinese, business cards, marketing material, everything, or Arabic, or whatever, Portuguese, whatever language that we need help, we do that. General manager will write a letter in a different language, welcoming that guest. We also have to be always smart to know what is the competition doing. You're here at Georgia State, but what are all the other universities doing? Are you the top? Do they come to you for best practices or do you have to look to others? Knowing who your competition is, knowing what people in your space are doing, your industries is important. It's not good if all my hotels serve miso, if all the hotels in the market are serving miso soup because it's a high Japanese footprinted area where I live and then I decide, wow, I'm a rock star, I am too. No, I'm not. I'm just keeping the par. I need to be ahead. So always know what other universities, what other nonprofits, what other um, organizations are doing in your space, and then think what you can do to be ahead all the time. And that's my job, is to make sure my team stay ahead of the H hotels. That's all I can say. No, <laughs> no, no, just that's my job, is to make sure that we are always ahead of everybody else, and that's what I like to do. So here's a great story. So now we're gonna talk about how that cultural competency does impact the bottom line. Here's the case of the uh, Renaissance, and they started catering to the Jewish and Korean weddings. Who would have thought? And what did they do? I'm going to show you in the next video of helping build loyalty with even the Japanese guests. But this is what happens. When we do things that are culturally competent, it drives the bottom line results. So they were able to increase um, the preference of this hotel, the revenue, the occupancy. So these are the terms in our world that we use to measure our metrics. So let's see what they did. Diversity at this property has come very naturally due to the fact that we live in Sao Paulo and there's so many cultures. We receive a lot of different diverse cultures here of our guests. We have to personalize each and every stay. And we have training that makes sure that all the staff does this. We do diversity training for our associates. We are one of the few properties in the market that provide this type of training. 20% of our weddings are Jewish or Korean. So we know how to deal with them and they're very happy. And they distribute this information to the community and they come back and do more and more events. The Japanese market, which is one of the larger markets that we have, they have a lot of special details that we have to do every time that they arrive. It's not a specific group. By addressing these differences in cultures and meeting those needs of those guests, we're able to uh, drive our occupancy and create uh, a preference. We are uh, actually making more revenue. Which definitely works uh, and has makes business sense. We like that, making more revenue. But it's not only about making money, it's the right thing to do. Right? Marriott is a company that welcomes all guests, no matter who they are. We want to have that, that our team members are ready to welcome everybody equally and respectfully. All right, so this is my story. The Deerfield Residence Inn is where my really, how my job came to where I am today. You're probably wondering, how did a finance major end up in culture? That's, that's not a normal path. I didn't take anthropology. I didn't take any of these classes. So 12 years ago, I went back to work 
And when I went back to work, I decided I am not doing any more pro formas, no more discounted cash flow models, no more valuations of physical therapy centers. I didn't want to do numbers. I wanted to do something a little sexier, a little more glamorous, and the hospitality world sounded great. You know, I have a pool at the hotel that I could see, could never use, but it was nice to see every day. So my parents had um, bought a few hotels in 1998. Um, about 20 years ago and my brother and I were talking and he's like I'm not doing anything with those you have to do something so I thought oh boy I better learn this industry if, if at some point they're going to say we need you to help out um, so I went to a resort in Chicago and at that resort I learned to be a corporate sales manager that was a lot more fun than running numbers all day but the finance degree, which I thank my father every day for, was in my back pocket and it was useful in understanding how my revenue team and sales team could work together. You can't give the whole house away, Seema, just because you sold a $100,000 piece of business, giving 50,000 con concessions is not a good profit margin. So working with the revenue team, working with the finance team, they felt very comfortable working with me because I understood profit margins and how to make sure that, you know, still as a for-profit business, we had to make sure that our bottom line was okay. It was 2008 and the Marriott world changed their sales force and what they decided is that we would be global sales. We're going to sell all 18 brands, which is what we were at that time. One of the brands is the Residence Inn. Have you heard of the Residence Inn? Okay, there's one right across the street which I stayed at, so thank you very much. Um, so this is my personal passionate uh, preference because of the story that comes with it. But with the 30 brands, and hopefully all of you have stayed at a Marriott or Starwood Hotel at some point, um, I'm hoping, and um, if you have, I appreciate that. Residence Inn is a very unique brand because it's really designed for an extended stay traveler. It has a kitchen, it gives complimentary breakfast every morning, and it also has some manager specials in the evening. So technically, if a guest is there for a long time, they can get about 10 meals free, seven breakfast and three manager specials. When you're working with budgets and numbers of your company gives you a per diem maybe, this is kind of useful. So I noticed in 2008 when I took on the global role that there was a, several Indian travelers staying at a nearby competitor. And I'm thinking, why are they staying at that competitor? Why aren't they staying at my hotel? It was another extended stay property. So 2008, do you remember the economy was not so good? And we had to think a little differently on how we get business to our hotel. Do I share shift the existing market? Because I'm not getting a lot of new business coming through. So I worked with my general manager at the hotel. And that's another thing is good, strong partnerships with your business teams. And I said, Carolina, there's about 2,000 room nights at that hotel, and I'd really like them to come to my hotel, the residence inn. And she's the general, and she goes, okay, what do you think we should do? I said, well, first of all, we have a couple of obstacles, or what people would think are obstacles. We are seven miles away from the office. The competitive hotel is a half a mile. So I gotta convince them to go further. And I have an outdated property. It hasn't been renovated. Um, it is called a Gen 1 residence inn, which means it's old style apartment buildings. So I've got a couple of challenges, but like a good salesperson, that doesn't stop us. We're gonna figure out a way. So we decided to take a different spin. And instead of trying to win on a beauty factor of our hotel, we're gonna win on the cultural competency factor. We're gonna give breakfast items at, um, that are ethnic food. So in addition to the full spread that a residence in would offer, we threw in a couple of Indian items. So these people who are coming here for six months, 12 months, 18 months, they had some home food, comfort food. For those of you who've traveled around the world, after a certain point, do you miss home food? I, I need a slice of pizza. I, I need some mac and cheese. I just need something that is something I recognize. That's how these people feel. If you're in another country for six months, 18 months, and the brand did well because of the kitchen, right? So they can at least cook their ethnic foods. So we came up with a bunch of different items that we can to the travel manager said, hey, we're gonna do this at our hotel. Can you give us a trial? Send your next group of people to my hotel. If they don't like it, it's fine, but can you give me a shot? So we did Indian newspapers. We put Indian TV stations in all the rooms. We took them to the Indian grocery store every weekend so they could buy food for their kitchen. We had Bollywood nights. So once a month, we hosted a Bollywood night, general manager special, all Indian food was catered from a local restaurant, which we partnered with, and guess what? It wasn't the Indian guests that were thrilled, it was all the non-Indian guests <laughs> who loved the Indian food because it was a change for them. It was variety. So as our millennial travelers are coming through for us, 
these kids are very different than when we grew up. They want to try, they want to experience, they want to tr do a local something. They're different. They're a lot bold and they want to do everything on Instagram and everything's out there. So it's important for us to make sure that they have a good experience. By doing all of these things that we did, we were able to move the needle. So we moved 2,000 room nights over and this is some of our results. We went, um, occupancy went from 15 to 30% in just a short time of six months. Um, REVPAR is a word that we use in our industry. It's revenue per available room that also increased. So these are the measurements that we use. But the main thing is the beauty was at the end of the day, I actually oversold the hotel. When you get 100% occupancy at your hotel or when you get your student enrollment, that top number that you can get, it's a good feeling. And I had to tell the general manager, oh my gosh, I'm actually having to turn people away. Well, that's a problem I'd like to have. I'd like to have. So this story went, and I was still a salesperson, it went to corporate. And um, who is my current boss now, Apoorva Gandhi, who you saw in the video, um, I gave it to him. I said, hey, you know, do you need this? Do you, what are we going to do with this? I can, you know, I'd like to showcase this because I want other hotels in our um, distribution to know that they can do this too. So he, at that time, he just turned into the VP of Multicultural Affairs, and he goes, this is perfect. He started showcasing it. I'm still in sales. And a year later, they said, listen, we need you to do this for all the 4,000 hotels. At that time, it was 4,000. Today, we're at 6,000. So they asked me to come in and work with hotels. Started with one um, culture, India, and now I do 12 cultures. So this, and I'll explain my program a little bit later, but that is how cultural competency will drive. All right, you got your popcorn and candy because we're going to have another video of the sequel of Multicultural, and these are three new countries that you get to see. So let's see what you learned or what you already knew. We're so glad to have you staying with us, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Croft. Thank you. We're excited to be here. It's the first time here. Yeah. Now, I see that we have your reservation for only one room mm -hmm. with only one king size bed. Yes. Hmm. Let me see if I can find <laughs> a room to Actually, I reserve that as our preference, so a king size bed is fine. Thank you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Stop the interaction. You have unintentionally offended your guests. Here are some important lessons from one of our multicultural experts. Before automatically changing a room request, verify with the guests what they prefer. By making assumptions, you may accidentally insult or offend them. At Marriott, it's our job to make sure associates are knowledgeable about the LGBT market. Express the same warm welcome to these guests and honor the guest request whenever possible. Associates should not comment on or question guest sleeping arrangements. If you can't deliver on a request, offer alternatives the way you would for anyone else. For more information, the LGBT Toolkit on MGS will serve as a great resource. Let's rewind the scene and try the guest. We're so glad to have you staying with us, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Croft. Thank you. We're excited to be here. It's our first time in the area. Welcome. We have your reservation for a room with a king bed. I hope that meets your expectations. That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Have a great stay. This is Mr. Wu, our senior executive. Welcome, Mr. Wu. Here are your keys. And here are your keys, Mr. Chen. Elevators on your left-hand side. Please enjoy your stay. Uh, you've accidentally given my room to Mr. Wu. I am on a higher floor than him. No, I believe I gave each of you the correct keys. Enjoy your stay. <laughs> Freeze right where you are. There's been a cultural misunderstanding. Within the Chinese culture, there are different expectations when it comes to room assignments. Let's hear from one of our multicultural experts and find out what our associates should have done differently. In China, status and ranking are very important. Accordingly, senior executives are typically placed on higher floors than the junior executives. Furthermore, four is considered an unlucky number in China, as its pronunciation in Chinese is similar to the word death. In contrast, the Chinese consider eight to be a lucky number, as the pronunciation in Chinese sounds like the word wealth. When possible, place your Chinese guests on the eighth floor or in building eight. They will appreciate it. Here's a fun fact. The Beijing Olympics began on August 8th, 2008 at 8.08 .08 p.m. I guess it is a lucky number. Mm -hmm. Let's rewind the 
scene and try it again. Here you are, Mr. Wu. Elevators will be on your left hand side. Please enjoy your stay. Here you are, Mr. Chen. Room 81828. Very lucky. Great for business meetings. Thank you very much. For me too. Room 518. This is a lucky hotel for us. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy your stay. Oh, hello, Mr. Nassar. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. We're planning on having our breakfast and we, we need to eat by 5 a.m. no later than 5.30 before sun rises. Oh. Will the bistro be open? I'm sorry, sir, but the bistro doesn't open for breakfast until 6.30. But it is Ramadan. You should consider other alternatives. Ramadan? I'm sorry, sir. I'm less familiar on how Ramadan is celebrated. What do we do? Freeze! This is a cultural misunderstanding. At Marriott, we're taking every initiative to educate our global team on the cultural practices and preferences of our guests. Our multicultural team is here to help you become more culturally savvy. Let's have our expert weigh in on this scene. Alternatively, provide food options in the market and a list of local restaurants that serve halal food after sunset. Halal foods are prepared in accordance with Muslim law and exclude certain forbidden foods. <coughs> Let's try another option and replay the scene. Hello, Mr. Nassar. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. We're planning our breakfast morning and we need to eat by 5 a.m., no later than 5.30 before sun rises, because we're fasting in observation of Ramadan. Will the bistro be open? Well, our bistro does not open until 6.30 for breakfast. However, um, we'd be happy to offer you our, one of our meeting rooms to have a continental breakfast in if your group would like to eat together. And we also have halal-friendly uh, items in our market that's open 24 hours a day. How about that? Oh, thank you so much for thank taking you. care You're of welcome. us. That is, so, that is perfect. Thank you. Multicultural Superheroes! Visit the Multicultural Booth and increase your cultural confidence. Netflix, okay. It's worthy of Netflix. That's good to know. So I just got to tell you a little of the bloopers that happened on this one. First scene, they are actual couple. And uh, they were great. I just saw them at a general manager's conference. And um, we had a lot of fun putting that one together. Second one, it's interesting because um, the Chinese guest, I actually just got my room number. It was 808 here. So I was very elated because I do like the eight number now <laughs> since it sounds so uh, sounds like wealth. And on the third scene, the poor server, it was 20 takes before we could <laughs> nail down that scene. So we actually write it down on paper. <laughs> Something to look at to remember all her lines. But we had a lot of fun putting these together. Hopefully you just got a little takeaway, but understanding why it's important of understanding other people's cultures. So, all right, continuing on, here are the associations that Marriott partners with. Just like you have so many that you have affiliated with, these are some of the ones that we partner with. Um, these are what my boss does more is the external partnership relationships, and I work more with the internal hotel side. Why do we like these organizations? They're great groups. They do great things. We want to align with great people and their missions and what they stand for. Great professional development opportunities. So when we're recruiting, we can sit there and say, hey, you know, we have a talent acquisition team. Let's look at some of these organizations. Great opportunity for PR and marketing, of course. And they do a lot of good business. They're using our hotels. We want to be there for them all the time. Love Travels. This was a campaign that we initiated about two years ago. It's a multicultural inclusive campaign. It conveys our commitment to make everyone feel comfortable when they're at our hotels and that everywhere they travel, Love Travels. So this is a very popular campaign. Maybe you've seen these ads before. I'm not sure. All right. This is what I do for my company. I put together a website, an internet website for them. It didn't exist five years ago, but it's there for them to get resources, newsletters that go out, talk about holidays. Speaking of Ramadan, it starts May 15th, next week. If you have colleagues, be mindful if they're fasting. Okay, it's hot here, and they're not allowed to drink water. 
all day long. So just be mindful to these things and help them out when you can. And it is 30 days long. So it begins on May 15th. But I talk about holidays. So they're ready at the hotels what you can do or what you can do in your organization to recognize somebody that might be celebrating a um, international holiday. Um, the videos you saw, we have an LGBT toolkit out there. What are the words you can say? What you can't say? How do you work with transgender guests? What the different things that come up, you can only imagine in my world what we work with. And we want to be there for our teams to give them that comfort level. Thanks. We use Rosetta Stone. This has been a very powerful tool. We have, of course, having so many associates, over 600,000, we get a great deal on this as well. But we love Rosetta Stone. Why? Just like the beginning of any world is ABCs and one, two, threes, when you want to connect with someone of a different background and you know just a few words, it makes a huge impact, a huge impact for them. Can you guess what the top five languages um, enrolled are that we, that we might have? Spanish, Spanish yes. Chinese. Chinese. Arabic. Arabic was not on this list. French. French. Nope. Didn't mean English and it was Italian. But the landslide was Spanish, 36% enrolled. Everything else was under 6%. But this tool is great. Has anybody used Rosetta Stone? Yeah, how do you find it? Fascinating. Fascinating. Easy to use. Yes, we, every time we went to a different country, my kids would get on, they'll learn a few words in Italy, wherever they're going, and they want to immerse in the culture. They want to immerse. They're like, we don't want to be the American who doesn't know anything. We want to like, feel like people know that we understand their culture. So great, great use if you, if you get a chance or need learning just a few words. You don't have to always be. It's great if you can be fluent, but even if you can just do some few conversation sentences, important ones to me are like, where's the bathroom, you know, things like that. But just understanding is all that we're asking. Culture Wizard. Has anybody heard of this tool? Okay, so this is a tool we use at Marriott. It's free for all of our associates. You can learn about 150 different cultures around the world, everything from dining etiquette to business etiquette. Phenomenal tool that we use. It's online. They even have a, um, a ch uh, chat box. If I want to get something answered within 24 hours, an expert will answer me back, and I've tested it just to make sure. So it's been a great tool for our teams. If they can't reach me directly right away, they just need to quickly look at something, this is another fa um, fantastic tool that we've offered to our associates, which has been great for them. Culture Day program. So this is a program that I initiated and created about four years ago. My thought was that if you really want to understand the culture, you need to immerse in the culture. You need to try the food, hear the language, listen to the music, see things and feel things and use your five senses when you're working with someone of a different culture. So this program that we created, the Culture Day program, is a one-day program. I go into a market, and the biggest one that started was the India Culture Day because the Indian weddings provide so much business for a hotel. Has anybody ever been to an Indian wedding? A few of you? Are they short, like an hour? No, 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 they're not an hour. Huh? They're five days. They're, they're long. They're long. And they're not just 100 people. That's our birthday party. They're four to 800 people. Okay. So when you think about that, a hotel is very wanting to learn about this business. So they started off saying, Seema, please teach us about the Indian weddings and everything we can do to understand the culture, the terms, the words that come with it. Why is the horse coming down the street? Something unique in our wedding. So I've started the program teaching them everything from the Indian 101. What's the business protocol, the social, the customs, the holidays, everything about the culture? What's important to the people of this culture? Then, once you understand, you can dive into the Indian wedding. We did this, then we took them to an Indian restaurant. They get to experience the food. We took them to a sari shop. They can try on some clothes. Took them to a grocery store. Food is a universal language. Everybody can speak food language, right? So understanding what they could put an amenity in a guest, in a guest room. So this program design, fought, mm, I started in 2014. 14, I believe it's been four years. It started, one, it started with just sales, and now every discipline comes to our classes, and it's general managers, corporate, HR, everybody comes to the classes, and we do 12 cultures. What's becoming a more popular program because of large cities, and it's hard to get to the ethnic district, 
is we did three cultures in a day. My top five most requested cultures from the field, India, China, Middle East, and then we have LGBT and Jewish. So these are my top five that I get the most requested when I'm asked to come out and, and present for the day. So my goal is to not just give them, here's what you can do. Yeah, you can put green tea in the room, but let's understand the culture and the mindset of the person before we dive into what you can do. All right, two years ago, one of my hotels said, Seema, I really like what you do, but can you do it for our customers? Because our customers are also working in global organizations. And they want to know, Toyota or Siemens, they want to know how do they interact with people in different countries. So we put on a program for this particular Kansas City group. Yep, who would have thought? Kansas City. And I think you're going there today, and a few of you are going back to Kansas City. So this program was started there where we then cater to an external customer audience. And I want to show you a two-minute video that kind of explains how the customers felt about this day. Two years ago, we launched a program called the Culture Day program. The thought was that if our sales and team members are more culturally competent, they'll have a better guest experience, a better client relationship when working with our guests. Today, we started the first time ever in Kansas City, an external customer event. We brought Culture Day to our customers. I'm glad that Marriott is putting on these type of classes because in the Civil Air Patrol, working with people from all nationalities, be it at a disaster, be it in recruiting, whatever the case may be, by understanding their cultural backgrounds, it allows me to communicate better with them in whatever situation we find them in. What we realize is our customers are also involved in multinational companies where they need to know how do you interact with international guests, international associates, vendors, employees, owners, and how to operate more successfully when you have business interactions. Think about who you might interact with, whether it's a Chinese associate employee, whether it's a Japanese president. The sales executive at the Marriott knew that my CEO president that I work with on a daily basis is Japanese and so she invited me and she thought that this would be an amazing experience for me to immerse myself in the Japanese culture even more than what I work with. I'm not asking you today to change, I'm asking you to think differently from another person's lens. If we could just help people learn more and be more respectful and reach out and get the global mind which is what um, we're talking about here today. As a leader within our organization and watching as Marriott continues to grow globally, it only made sense for us to really take what we know and share it with our customers. To strengthen that cultural competence and have it start right here in Kansas City, it's pretty exciting. It feels great to know that we're making a difference, that it's not just about business, but it's about being better people and caring about those people in this world. It's important if you work with someone, if you're at dinner with someone, if you're friends with someone, that you respect where they came from and the things that they believe in and their values so that they do the same for you. Okay, so that's how we took it one level out to internal to external, which we are enjoying. I'm going to leave you with one slide story. So in this situation, why it's important to be culturally competent, there was a very disappointed salesperson of a cola product. We'll say Pepsi, because Marriott is a Pepsi partner. And even though we're in Atlanta, I should say Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> so I'll say Coca-Cola since we're in Atlanta. Uh, he returned from his assignment from Saudi Arabia. And his friend said, oh, were you successful? You know, he's like, you know, I'm not sure what happened. I, I, I made these flyers. And I, and I thought they would be great, and I posted them all over town. And, you know, I didn't speak Arabic, so I thought pictures would be really great. And he goes, look, I did the first poster. You know, there's a man. He's lying in the desert. And then guess what? He drinks our awesome cola product, and now he's up and running again. This is great, right? I mean, this is cola. is giving you energy. And the guy goes, well, that sounds really, really great. I can't understand why it didn't work. He goes, well, nobody told me that they read from right to left. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we need to know how to be a little bit culturally competent at time and do our homework before that. 
Um, I also want to take a minute before I uh, thank you is just to say for the mothers in the room today, um, I have a fun little slide or picture for you. Um, <laughs> and if you are a mother, you can attest to this. But happy Mother's Day to those of you who will be out there celebrating. And here's one, uh, these are my girlfriends had passed these on to me and I wanted to share them with you. And then also the modern mom. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you very much. And I think I did okay ending on time, keeping respectful to that. And um, I am here this afternoon if you have any questions. You guys are a terrific audience. I thank you very much for your time today and hope you took some takeaways that you enjoyed. <laughs>